Perspective down Prince William Street is a kind of a visual summary of the past two centuries here. Trinity Light, or the Three Sisters as it's more commonly called, welcomed mariners to the fourth largest port in the British Commonwealth. Out at the mouth of the harbor is Partridge Island. Its role in the story of the vast wave of immigrants is still being talked about today. And then there are the buildings. The buildings are a kind of a monument to the spirit of a city that rebuilt its inner core within a year of a disastrous fire that destroyed at least a third of it. So welcome to the first city to be incorporated in Canada. Welcome to St. John, New Brunswick. An August morning and a shroud of fog engulfs the Atlantic Special as it pulls into the city. Its horn greets an older neighborhood of paint box colored tenements perched on the shoreline where once malice seats and micmacs camped. At the mouth of the 600 kilometers in John River where fresh water meets the sea, double crested cormorants the same species that once competed with the native people for fish, wait patiently. On a similar day, nearly 400 years ago, Samuel de Champlain took note of this waterway as one of the largest and deepest we had yet seen. It was on St. Jean Baptiste Day, 1604. This morning is the start of a typical day in the life of the cormorant. For them, knowing the tide patterns is instinctual. The rising waters from the Bay of Fundy will soon deliver a banquet of fish, their main staple. By day's end, the current will reverse itself, low tide allowing the river a freer run. This natural phenomena, the reversing falls, is a part of daily life in St. John. Thirty years after Champlain's visit to what was to become part of French Acadia, Charles de la Tour built a fort. Trading in furs, he launched a history of commerce and laid the cornerstone for a city at the foot of the bay. The signing of the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 would see the St. John River Valley ceded to England. Acadian settlers would gradually become displaced by colonists from New England. Fort Latour became the commercial enterprise of Simons, Hazen, and White, and would continue for generations. Predominant are heritage buildings. Widespread architectural influences are everywhere, varying from neighborhood to neighborhood. Streetscapes tell of the past, clearly defining the city's layers of history. Arthur Doyle is publisher of the Telegraph Journal and Evening Times Globe. The Loyalists landed in St. John in 1783. Uh, they landed uh, in, a, in a town, a village, that uh, had just a few hundred people uh, who traded with the Indians. 14,000 of them uh, arrived in New Brunswick in the spring fleet. They pitched tents and built rough cabins on what is now the King's Square and around that part of the what is now the city. Uh, the first few winters were among the harshest that had been remembered here for a long, long time. 
Uh, many of these people, of course, the Loyalists were, had been sophisticated the people who had been used to living quite comfortably in New England. Uh, so this was a very bitter experience for them. The old Loyalist burial ground in the present-day downtown core pays tribute to the many who witnessed streets carved from the wilderness. Within two years of this early influx, St. John became incorporated as a city, making it Canner's first and only to be so constituted by royal charter, this in 1785. Resources from land and sea gave birth to undertakings that would steer the new community toward a position at the round table of the world economy. The first uh, trade that uh, the St. Johners uh, undertook uh, was lumbering uh, and uh, cutting masts and shipping them out to Britain for the British Navy. And uh, we had some of the tallest masts that there were available in the British Empire. They were needed for the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, as time went by, uh, shipbuilding itself became an industry in New Brunswick, uh, concentrated to a large extent in St. John. And St. John became masters of shipbuilding in the early decades of the 19th century. In fact, we developed such a merchant navy here that uh, it became one of the largest in the world. And our ships were seen on, on every corner of the globe. St. John maintains a tradition of shipbuilding that has spanned the evolution of the city. It is only the technology that has changed. Vessels like these Canadian Navy frigates are built in modules to be later assembled in dry dock. To the city that was once called the Liverpool of America, and on the heels of the Loyalists, came arrivals from Ireland. Peter Toner is a professor of history. The main factor which brought the Irish to St. John in the post-Waterloo period uh, would have been the timber trade. Uh, timber was one of the essential ingredients in the Industrial Revolution. England could not have gone through the Industrial Revolution without building materials, which came uh, to a large extent from British North America, from New Brunswick. And ships uh, traveling back and forth carrying timber brought passengers rather than ballast was a way of uh, generating revenue. Now, these people who left Ireland, especially in the early period, were not, uh, you might say, the refuse of that society. No, these were people that had a certain uh, advantage. They had the capital to buy their passage. And um, they probably had the motivation to emigrate. They weren't the poorest of the poor. Even if they exhausted their resources getting here, the one thing which was in short supply in the Brunswick society at the time was labor. You could never get enough labor, and wages for manual labor at the time were far higher than what they were in any part of the British Isles. So a lot of the Irish would move through St. John, out onto the land, uh, begin to farm, and that in turn uh, stimulated the growth of St. John as the principal port of trade. These people had to have consumer commodities, and this, of course, could be provided by the British economy. Tens of thousands of Irish immigrants arrived here in St. John, and even though the vast majority of these Irish immigrants carried on to go somewhere else, to Boston, other parts of the United States. There were enough of these Irish immigrants that stayed here to completely transform the character of the city. And by about 1850, St. John had been transformed from a collection of American villages into an Irish city. Now integral to North American commerce and defense, Britain constructed the Fort Howe blockhouse to ward off privateers, and later the Carlton Martello Tower to defend this prize location during the War of 1812. It was a golden age of wind, wood, and sail, which saw new businesses spring up overnight. The period also witnessed the beginning of a Jewish immigration, tobacconists and clothiers from Britain, who had come to set down roots. With its mercantile base virtually unparalleled, and within a decade of Sir Leonard Tilly leading New Brunswick into Confederation, tragedy struck. At two o'clock on the afternoon of June 20th, 1877, sparks from a lumber mill at York Point landed in hay stored nearby. 
Within minutes, gale force winds flung the embers onto wooden outbuildings, storing everything from oil to gunpowder, pitch, and canvas. The tinderbox buildings became engulfed as flames spread across the city. 10 hours later, 1,600 buildings were gone, 18 people dead, 13,000 homeless, with a property damage estimated at $28 million. The news made international headlines. In the aftermath of Black Wednesday, relief flowed in. A new city was built almost overnight. But there were more challenges. Changes were happening in shipbuilding. The national policy and the railway were pulling to central and western Canada. But the St. John spirit remained. Author George Stewart defiantly wrote, from these very ashes and ruins, a brighter, more glorious and prosperous city will arise and resume her old place as the metropolis of the lower provinces. The city of St. John and the sea are inseparable. For decades following the great fire, she struggled to regain her status of old, augmenting trade with industry. Today, the harbor continues to play a key role in the economic life, as does brewing, sugar and oil refining, and pulp and paper. St. John is one of only two year-round ice-free ports in eastern Canada, handling approximately 12 million tons of cargo annually. A 24-acre landmark sits in the harbor that, like the sea, is woven into St. John's story. For two centuries, isolated lightkeepers ensured the safe passage of ships. Here in the 1800s, the world's first steam-operated foghorn was heard. That is part of the heritage of Partridge Island. Harold Wright has focused on the darker side of the story, the overwhelming tragedy of the island's role as an immigration quarantine station. It is a tale of, of, of tragedy, of sorrow. Uh, there are six graveyards out here, about 2,000 burials, half of them are children. Uh, there used to be 13 hospitals on this small island. Uh, the station was established in 1785, and most visitors think of us as Canada's version of Ellis Island, but we're always quick to point out that we're about 100 years older than Ellis Island. Ships returning from Europe carried a human cargo, willing to exchange their life savings for passage to the land of opportunity. A vessel arriving with illness among its passengers, smallpox or cholera, the most common, was required to notify officials whereby a physician would row out for inspection. The holes were a breeding ground for disease. The shipboard conditions can only be described as inhumane, or cruel, uh, where you would uh, literally have six or eight people squeezed into a bunk area that was uh, large enough for two. Uh, they would be placed in the hold of a vessel. There'd be no, no fresh air. There's no light. The hatch would be closed. Uh, no fresh water. Uh, you'd have barrels of water with untold whatever growing and swimming around the water. And these unhealthy uh, uh, conditions of sanitation, lack of food, water, air, led to the outbreak of many diseases. Uh, many of these vessels did not have uh, doctors aboard. Uh, there was no medicine. In fact, there are many documented accounts, even here for St. John in Partridge Island, where uh, the immigrants, be they sick or dead, um, would be uh, taken and uh, a weight attached to their feet, and they would be thrown overboard. Um, and, and of course, that's especially tragic uh, for those who were sick and had yet died. Um, and the idea behind this was so that the, uh, the quarantine doctor on Partridge Island would not detect the disease aboard vessel, and therefore the vessel would not be placed in quarantine. If conditions on board were horrible, the island was a living hell. The small, primitive facilities with limited staff were constantly overwhelmed by the thousands who arrived. The six-month immigration season of 1847 lists 2,000 who died in the most squalid conditions. And if you can imagine, one doctor, one nurse, uh, 400 hospital beds, and the island literally crowded with sick and dying people on the open ground. Uh, there wasn't enough food, there wasn't water, uh, no blankets, no medicine. Uh, the graveyard was not only used for the burial of the dead, but uh, if the doctor suspected that you would be soon among the dead, then you were placed there as a prelude to burial. The island's a volcanic rock, and it's very 
very little uh, soil. So after a, a good rain, uh, those bodies that had been buried would be exposed. And uh, the decaying bodies only added to the, the misery of the, the sick. And uh, St. John is known for fog. Uh, we're known for a bit of rain in the summertime. And uh, you can imagine being on the ground, being sick, uh, with no covering, no medicine, and it's foggy or it's raining. Um, they suffered uh, untold horrors. It was a struggle for human survival amid primitive medical science. St. John residents, incensed with the inhumane conditions, pushed for better facilities. By the 1860s and 70s, improved ocean carriers and medicine eased the hardships. But by the 90s, with government motivation to settle the West with offers of cheap land, immigration numbers once again taxed the facility. Island hospitals expanded to accommodate shiploads from Great Britain and Eastern Europe. But the dreadful losses seemed without end. Of the records kept of life here, none is more poignant than the handwritten diary of Nellie McGowan, whose father was a lighthouse keeper until he himself succumbed to illness and died in 1902. Her childhood, a lonely one, was spent on Partridge. And here, where markers commemorate the names of Irish and Jewish people, at age 26, she wrote of a young Scot named William McCrae. Down on the east side by the sea the grave is, and far away his mother, or perhaps a wife for all we know, may wonder why he no came back again. The rebuilding of St. John, following Black Wednesday, involved hundreds of architects, masons, carpenters, furiously working for that miraculous year. One of the few prominent landmarks to survive the fire occupies one city block and continues to play an important role in the day-to-day -day life of the community. This is the city of today. The community's personality, with its population of 120,000, reflects a wide spectrum of residents. Throughout history, the continuous movement of people, exposure to universal ideas and trends that are distinctive to harbor towns, has left St. Johners a sense of place, and this is where they're likely to meet. A touchstone in the center of town that has seen continuous service since 1876. Before then, the shoppers had to endure the mud and the dust of summer and in winter. Well, you don't even want to think about that. So finally, the town fathers came up with a break for the shoppers with this, what you might call, an early concept of an indoor mall. Not much has changed here since the beginning. If you look up at the ceiling and the rafters up there, you can almost imagine an upside down hull of a ship. And that probably comes from the shipwrights who took part in the construction. And then at closing time, another tradition comes into play here. The clerk rings a bell, and that signals the close of trade for the day. Then the original iron gates swing closed on the oldest common law market still in operation. Just a few doors down from the old city market along Charlotte Street here, is another great story. It was here, on the top two floors of this building, that a young man set up shop in the late 1800s. Isaac Erb was his name, and photography was his game. For almost a half a century, he captured the life and times of this city and beyond.
This is pretty typical of his photography. Shoeshine boy Charlie Brown. And on Charlie's hat is the whole story. His rates, 10 cents a shine, no credit. <laughs> Herb's legacy is now a private collection, a remarkable inventory of some 4,000 glass plates. Through his eyes, we can get a glimpse of the St. John of his day. The images of St. John reflect visually what the editorial of the Globe of 1883 put into words. It sums up the intellectual outlook of a then newly formed New Brunswick Historical Society at a time when Canada was seeking to define its own national identity. Our city, situated at the mouth of a noble river and commanding by its position a large trade, should be first in the hearts of the people. The idea should prevail that what is for her benefit and for her advantage is for the benefit of the whole state. To build her up, to make her learned, prosperous and generous, and to fill her with happy, comfortable homes. To make her a place where commerce, art, science and religion combine to elevate and improve all who came within her borders should be the ambition of her children. Those who have built her up, making her learned, prosperous, and generous, have come from all over the world. The city has welcomed them, and they have left their mark. A couple of years ago, there was a scholar in from Queen's University in Belfast, and he took three rolls of films of some of the 19th century architecture here because he claimed that the houses that were built during that period in St. John, in many cases, would duplicate houses built in Belfast during the same period. The uh, people, when they got the money, tried to recreate some of the things they left behind. An inheritance for a new generation of her children. A reminder of struggle, dreams, sorrow, and accomplishments. Carved into the buildings of Canada's oldest incorporated city, St. John, New Brunswick. It'll always be home.